All right, so welcome back to The Dinner Truth. It's your boy, Tina. We are back with another episode. I know I've been delaying this. Um, went overseas, traveled, and basically just had to make sure, you know, everything was right when I come back. I wanted to make sure that this shit was hard for, for everyone listening. Um, so, yeah, so let, let's, let's do this thing. So today we got a very multifaceted person, and you can tell I'm using these big words now, multifaceted. Um, so today we got someone who's not only an event promoter, artist manager, as an artist himself, um, someone who I've been really watching, just really watching in regards to um, sort of the business moves and, and, and someone who's been really trying to, really investing in the creatives in Sydney. So today we got Nick with us. Um, so Nick, how are you? I'm very good, Tino. Thank you very much for having me on your podcast, bro. I'm a big, big fan, been following what you do, and uh, it's an honor to be invited to come and talk to you. No worries, man. It's an honor to have you. And look, honestly, it was not easy getting on you on here. I know you're busy. You're a very busy man. You're doing a lot of things. So, you know, we appreciate your time. Um, so, look, a little introduction of Nick. I'm going I'm to give you my introduction, and then I'm going to let you give you <laughs> I'll correct it. the other way around. <laughs> I'm going to give you what I'm going to say. Yeah. All right. So, um... For those who don't, who don't know, so Nick is um, artist manager for Chillin' It, um, artist manager for 18-year-old man, um, started, oh, well, one of the guys who helped started One Days, um, he's an artist himself, um, man of, he does a lot of shit. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so Nick, you tell us a little bit about yourself and, I think, and tell us. I think that you have uh, summed it up pretty well there. Mm-hmm. Um, First and foremost, uh, inner west of Sydney boy, born and raised. Yeah. Started out as a MC, as yep. a rapper, and kind of yeah found myself in a in a rap group, part of a crew, and then we started doing these parties one day, and now I have uh, sort of made this pivot towards artist management. But I should add as well, I am part of the 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 management team yep. of Chillin' It, an eighteen yep. year old man. So yep. it's kind of like me, and I have some co managers as well that we yep. work together. I don't want to be on here taking, taking all their credit, all, all 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 the credit for yeah. it. So I'm I'm very much a big fan and believer in working with a team where you yeah. can. You know what I mean? Most definitely. I mean, for what you guys are doing and 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 the span and all the different types of things, I don't think no one man could do it by himself. You definitely need a really good team and really good people around you to do it. So, you know, you talked a little bit about, you know, being raised in the inner West. So what was your sort of early introduction into music? Well, I mean, my early introductions to hip hop music were probably, you know, around the age of like 11 or 12. Mm -hmm. Normally the way that you, that you pick up music or trends or anything really when you're at that age is from you know older siblings or older cousins or whatever i didn't necessarily have older siblings in that regard when i was coming up but people at school at my primary school somebody came and told me about tupac yeah and i kind of like that just you know that set me off and that was the first hip-hop i heard and then i kind of just immersed myself in it i got to high school and Funnily enough, the guys that I, uh, you know, were part of my friendship group in, in high school in those early years are still the same guys. If that's one day. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. same people I make music with, make yeah. moves with, business partners, my best friends. So it all kind of happened at the start of high school. And I guess, yeah, we just, they, they had older siblings that kind of taught us about hip hop music. And the internet was popping them, but it was yeah. kind of like it wasn't in the same way that it is now. So you were still... I guess the pathway for us to getting into like rapping and and hip hop was graffiti in a lot of ways. Really? Growing, yeah, growing Shit. up in growing up in the inner west, there was a very very like healthy and thriving um, graph scene. Graffiti writers like the inner west is known for producing some of the best uh, graffiti writers in Australia. Yeah, and it was kind of like. Um, yeah, it was parallel. You know, we our introduction to it was this is hip hop culture. I mean, we weren't there break dancing on the yeah, on the lino yeah, mats yeah, on the yeah, corner. Yeah, you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. But it's it is an interesting and it was a quite a common path, I think, towards hip hop music was through graph. Nowadays, you don't it it doesn't necessarily go hand in hand. You know, yeah, there's yeah, there's yeah. kids that probably even younger nine ten start hearing rapping and they're just you know drawn to it but they're probably not like into necessarily into graffiti yeah, there's still yeah, a lot yeah. of crossover there but that was kind of how how we got into it. i went to high school and there was you know guys in the older years that were graffiti writers and they were rappers and that kind of made me want to do it and yeah. it is something about hip-hop that is quite like um ever 
how do I explain it? When you, it, there's something about the genre of music or the subculture, whatever you want to call it, that makes you want to be a part of it. Not just yeah, listen yeah. to it and be a fan, but I want to get involved in some way. I want to do this. I want to make beats or I want to rap or I want to, and I've always kind of loved that about it. You know what I mean? And that sort of leads me on to the, what I was going to get into next. I was going to sort of ask you, how did you, how did you get into the entertainment industry? Because... From my experience of what I've learned or what I've seen, like, there's a difference between, all right, I love music and I listen to different genres of music. And, you know, everyone always says, oh, I've got a good taste in it, right? Mm. Um, but what sort of made you want to actually pursue a career in entertainment? Was it some, something that you just, you and your boys just started rapping or like, you know, how, how did that start? Yeah, I never really thought about it like I want to pursue a career in the entertainment industry. Do you mm. know what I mean? I, like when I was... 13 14 that's when i first started like rapping in front of people yeah. do you know what i mean like i would go to mc battles and you know like i was I'm sneaking into clubs to to mc and yeah, I, I, yeah. I won a couple of mc battles around that age so i really have been doing this shit since i was real yeah. real young now i'm in my early 30s now um yeah. but yeah i just then me and my boy jimmy we just like we're gonna form a rap group we were a duo spit syndicate and we were like we're just gonna we're rap and we finished high school and we just started going to the studio our first time in the studio writing raps and trying to make songs and we want to put an album out and we want to um get signed to a label and we want to yeah. go touring and stuff and then uh you know i was studying at university at the time because yeah. i was you know i didn't really have any interest in it but yeah. i had started it and i thought i gotta finish Fuck, this finish it, and yeah. you know i want to respect my parents wishes and whatnot <laughs> yeah, and do all yeah, that yeah. um but then i was just kind of like now nah, i want to rap you know i want to be in this rap you know we want to do this we want to really do it and um that's just kind of how i fell into it and it was never like it wasn't like i wanted this is what i, I never thought it was going to be a career i still yeah, don't yeah. know if it's gonna yeah, be yeah, a career yeah, exactly, yeah. you know what i mean it's not yeah. nothing's promised but that was just kind of how it how it happened i wanted to rap we were in a group um we were self-managed for yep. a, l a lot of the time so we just kind of i learned a lot of things which have helped me you know um, in the the different paths that I would go down within this kind of sphere. Sorry, I don't know if that's a good answer. That's, that's a really good answer. Kind of, that, that, do you, do you? It just I kind of fell so into it. Happened, yeah, it just happened. happened. So I think I think that's a good point in saying that because you 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 started you started making music very early on, mm. and I remember um, going to high school and when I was in high school, honestly, it was it. The, the Australian hip-hop industry wasn't popping. I'm going to tell you the truth. No mm -hmm. one listened to Australian, Australian music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of my homeboys, he's actually a high school teacher. You know, and um, <laughs> and he's, I don't, I don't want to tell him to school. I don't want to expose him. Because <laughs> he'll, he'll tell me now that he's students. Yeah. They're, 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 they're with it. But, um, you know, he would tell me stories about how now he would go to school and then some of these kids are literally singing, you know, have songs. Yeah. Um, one, four songs. Yeah. They're chilling at songs. Like, they're actually, it's actually now so a part of you know the younger the younger generation or what they're doing like you know we don't need to have to, we don't need to have 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 to listen to music from the UK music to the US like now the youth are actually listening to music from Australia so it's very unique and um you you sort of a point that I want to get to was that um you sort of had a unique standpoint in my opinion because you started making music and you were sort of in this same pre lockout Mm. Right, and you sort of you sort of got to experience it uh, through there, like through one day, mm. actually rapping and being a part of that scene, and then you got to experience it after the lockout laws, and and you know, the, the when the lockout laws were sort of were sort of happening. So that being said, what was what was from your perspective, what was the sort of biggest difference, the biggest difference in you know pre lockout law versus after lockout law? Well. I mean, there's two kind of things that you, there's two shifts that you're kind of talking about there. Yeah. Like first, like is, is, is probably much broader than any lockout laws or any even city. And that's just probably like the, the type of hip hop that was being made in Australia yeah. back then. You know what I mean? Like when we were kind of getting involved in it and it was, it was pretty, I'm not going to say it was one dimensional, but the sort of like acts and the, and the stories that were being told were, were, were pretty limited in their scope. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Like they, yeah. it, it was fairly dude heavy, fairly Anglo. Like yeah. it was, it wasn't, there was some cool moments, but it was pretty cringe for a lot of people. Yeah, you know okay, what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. even when we, we, when me and me and Jimmy sort of started rapping and we were like, 
we had a lot of love for people like, uh, you know, How and Coolism and yeah. and fucking Hilltop Hoods and all of that. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. We we had love for that, but we were real. Like our favorite rappers were from New York. You yeah. know what I mean? We <laughs> yeah, love Jay Z yeah. and Nas and uh, all all of that. You know, Fabulous and you know Lloyd Banks. Like yeah, we really yeah, love yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so we often even got torn down because like uh, these we weren't rapping in American accents, but it was yeah. like these guys want to be American. They're wearing you know like uh, tight skinny jeans and flannels you know what I mean like it was it was pretty like it was pretty shit you yeah, know what I mean yeah, like yeah, it yeah. just wasn't a um, compared to now where it's just like the sort of stories which are being told and the diversity of the of the stories which are being celebrated and the music is just so much better do you yeah, know what I mean the quality 100%. of it so that shift is kind of like I mean, man, we could you could do a whole podcast just on that. The shift, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, just in terms of you know what you were saying, like your Australian hip hop wasn't really popping in the in the sense that it is now. It was just it's just been very different, and yeah. to where it's at now, like having seen that over the past fifteen years, and you know, there's people that are older than me that have seen it for over 20, 30 years. It's crazy. But you know what? I think it is also, and I think this is a great way to put it. How I see it was. I think a lot of the music that you so I, the, I feel like music is always a representation of what's happening in the current climate of wherever you are, right? So right now we're seeing a lot of diversity in whatever in diversity in the different acts, diversity in the different cultures who are making music, and I feel like that's that's extremely representative of the culture that we're living in in Australia. I feel as if you can have uh, you can have acts like OTG, One Four, and Chillin' It from different areas make different types of music, I guess. And all have different types of voices, mm. but then a lot of people resonate with them because they're they're relatable in a certain sense. So I feel like that relatability is something that um, really has really caused that big jump, you know. And of course, obviously, like Drew right now, it's popping. Not just in Australia, you can see it in the UK, you see it in America now. It's just starting to hit that market. But but just not even that. I think it's just like now anyone can fucking make music. Right, the yeah. Ease, the ease of entry to music now was like, you know, you don't necessarily, like you said, necessarily have to sign to a record label anymore. You can do a majority of your stuff independent if you have a good team around you, if you have good mates, or if you have, you know, a good management team. You can go to a studio, record your. No, don't even have to go to a studio. Mm -hmm. Sit in your bedroom, record your own shit, get a good graphic designer, put it up in Spotify, and then sort of build your build your character from there. But all that being said. You know, so you started rapping, you know, you grew up in the NOS and, you know, that was sort of your influence. So how did one day sort of happen? When, 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 how does one day sort of fit in this and how did you guys start it? So those, those guys that I was telling you about that were my friends at high school in yeah, those, in yeah. those first, those first couple of years and still to this day, we all, me and Jimmy sort of, we were like spit <coughs> syndicate. This is our duo. Yep. There was also Horror Show, who was another two guys mm -hmm. that were at the same school as I'm us. Familiar, more familiar with Horror Show. Yeah. yeah, yeah and, yeah. and, and so we were like. Uh, but we always because we started through graph and there was this thing of like uh, a crew you know what I mean everyone goes and does their own thing but you have a crew that you belong to and that yeah. you kind of represent so w one day it was always our crew and we yeah. always kind of like when we were you know young we were like we're going to start a label one day and it's going to be you know one day records or whatever yeah, yeah. but that never happened but one day was kind of like our our crew and so we all went off and like made music and did our own thing yeah. um, but we always had plans on kind of like coming together, together yeah. and making some more I mean we all sort of like we toured together and we would be we, we make sh music in the studio together so we yeah. were always kind of like heavily involved in each other's creativity and mm -hmm. whatnot around but it was kind of like in the background a little bit it yeah. wasn't sort of like uh, public facing but around 2013 I think it was we were like all right let's start a party we want to just start this Sunday party called one day Sundays and it's really just a, a, a you know no live acts just kind of like just DJs, DJs just yeah. like for our friends really the sort of music that we want to hear when we would go to a you know go to a party or go to a pub or a club or whatever and so we kind of started doing that. And then um, around the same time, we also put out a, a one day album. And so a lot of people kind of like associated it with, um, I guess, one day, the, the, the musical collective. Yeah, yeah, But yeah, then yeah. One Day Sundays as a party kind of just kind of like grew into something much bigger. Yeah. And a whole lot of people started like fucking with this party and wanted to come to it. Yeah. And most people that would come to it when it was really popping had no idea who Horror what Show and Spit on. Syndicate yeah. and, and who. And you know what? That doesn't matter. That yeah. never really bothered us because One Day Sundays was kind of just like about creating a space for all these different types of hip hop 
you know, from stuff that's made in Australia to stuff that's made in America to the UK to Europe to whatever, and not even hip hop stuff, you know, yeah. necessarily to all sit uh, alongside one another. Do you yeah. know what I mean? To, to to create this kind of space, and it's interesting that you mentioned before the um, the lockouts. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. And what sort of impact that had? Yeah. I mean, we didn't really we didn't really like start this party because of the lockouts it wasn't like a direct uh, yeah. co- you know r- result of that but it was certainly happening at the time you know what i mean yeah. where like there was a lot of this <clears throat> media led conservative media led hysteria about alcohol related violence and one punch and you know yeah, all, yeah. All, all this sort of stuff which got whipped up into this frenzy and the lockout laws were in place. And I guess our, uh, you started to see a lot more at the time, a lot more day parties. Yeah. yeah you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Things that, all right, well, if we can't party later, if you're telling Not us, earlier. you know what I mean? We're going to start earlier. Yeah. And so we didn't make a conscious decision to do that, but it was certainly, um, it was certainly around the same time. It, it made and sense. It, it made and, sense. And, and through that process, do you know what I mean? Like sort of being, all right, we just started, it's a free party. You know what I mean? We started doing it every month and then it kind of word spread and it kind of got bigger. You got to keep in mind, we were just like, we were artists and friends. We weren't promoters. We didn't really know anything about that sort of thing. But we had, you know, like when we were all together, we made moves and we were a good kind of unit. So it grew and it grew into something much bigger. And I guess it kind of like was a crash course in learning about promoting and the events business. And then also the wider context of Sydney and, you know, how it was kind of having these restrictions being put on it and not just the lockout laws, but, you know, it kind of like spilled out into other sort of um, other sort of areas, you know, police, licensing police and whatnot. And just seeing the effect that, um, you know, they would come down a lot harder on venues and it was just kind of, it was, it was a pretty dark time. You know <laughs> what I mean? Dark, but I, it, yeah. yeah, I think that in about 10 years time, I think when everything's a bit more established, you're going to be talking about this time as the dark times, like the dark, dark. but you know what? In, in that sense though, I feel like even though it was, it was some shit times, the, one of the biggest benefits of it, I think that people, people got a lot more creative. Like people had to think about a lot more creative ways for them to host things that they wanted to do, a lot more creative ways to get their art out and a lot more creative. And there were a lot more, I think, events that were created that now have a bigger platform because of that. Because people saw, you know, things like One Days, people saw things like like Salty systems that were that were still running even though they had all of this bad uh, bad publicity, all these thing, all these negative things in the in the media, um, all these restrictions on the different types of venues, you know, people. I think a lot of people now have a bigger appreciation for those events that were running at that time because they saw how hard it is for you know for them to keep it running, you know. So it's good. And and one thing I like about One Days as well was I think that you guys, even though you just said that you didn't necessarily, you're trying to get you know all these different types of music and try to hit you know all these different types of um music scenes but you guys also championed a lot of australian acts you know at a time where you know it was it was a great time for a lot of australian acts were making music and you guys were really trying to you know at least play the music you know at least try to get them to come to the you know come to the to the parties and i think a lot of people thought that was cool you know i think i think one thing that's good about one days is that is i don't think it's like a party anymore i think it's a it's a good community sort of event you know where people from not just the music scene but people from people in sydney general would come together and be like all right shit you know we can feel comfortable in in this venue so i think that's good i think that shows a good that, that that's a good event it's man more than it's event. To, to be honest like it was uh, it's one of the things i'm most proud of being involved in you know what i mean seeing yeah. in my life like seeing the one day sundays and that kind of community grow and grow you know when the events in in sydney when they were at the peak of it uh, it was happening at vic on the park and then it moved to the 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 factory just around the corner Mm -hmm. and it was kind of just like growing too too big for us and for the venue to kind of really like handle at the time but when it was really at full tilt just kind of looking around and just seeing all these people from different parts of sydney different backgrounds different walks of life coming together I mean, this is a clumsy example, but it's one that I've kind of, uh, I've used before when talking about this, like when we were growing up, when we were, you know, high school and then late teens, early twenties, whatnot, it was, you know, everyone, we all loved hip hop and every, you know, hip hop was still fucking growing and really popular then, but it felt 
segmented. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, you would I get have, you, you yeah. know, like a, a lot at the 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 Aussie hip hop sort of shows that we would play or we would go to, predominantly white. Again, pretty dude heavy until one day started, you know, like girls yeah. started coming to the shows. Then yeah. I like the thing. <laughs> but then you would have yeah. like the, you know, like the Asian R and B night or the yeah. Islander thing here, or it, it was kind of it was just scattered, and yeah, it, it, yeah. it would happen at night time in these yeah. dark clubs. And one of the things that that we helped do, and I don't like taking again, I don't like taking credit for this yeah. as something that we did because it's really about it's the culture, people that yeah. come to the party yeah. it's about the the DJs the artists the acts like it's not something that we did all by ourselves by any by any stretch yeah. but you'd suddenly see all these people together in the daytime do you know what I mean listening to listening to music and you're smiling the sun's hitting you in the face like it was it was something but, so simple but yeah. it really sort of like caught on mm. um I can't remember what the question was. <laughs> no, you're not, no, we're flowing, man. This is the dinner truth, man. Yeah. You get, we're getting to these little tandems. But no, no we're but, talking about, but we're flowing. But totally. And you know what? For us, it made sense. Like when we were having a, a party at a friend's house or we were having a kick on or whatever, we would play, you know, it made sense to play Horror Show, Manu Crooks, you know, Sampa, Kendrick, Travis Scott, all, uh, all next to line. each other. Yeah, yeah, Do you know I what I mean? Like that, that yeah, just, because yeah. that's what it was like. Yeah. Again, the internet played a, the internet has obviously had a, a massive shift on the way that people make music, mm. get their music out there, consume their music. You know, like it has just, not just music obviously, but Different types it, of arts, it just yeah. kind of like it, that all, that all made sense to us. And being able to create this place where everyone could kind of come together um, is, it, it, it was, it was great. And it was a real like crash course again in how these things happen you yeah. know what i mean the parties grew too fast in the first two years like it was free Do you yeah. know what i mean and it was just kind of like the venue's loving it because suddenly every sunday on what's normally a something. dead day yeah. they got something they had they were making so much money over the bar it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. crowded and it yeah. makes these venues it makes it cool did you hear about this party that's happening in maryville blah 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 but it just grows too big. Yeah. And then, you know, like towards the end there, too many people are coming and then the neighbors are cracking the shits because there's yeah. thing, bottles left around and it's, you know, cars get pissed on and things like this, yeah. you know? And then we had to move to, we had to introduce ticketing. We had to change venues because yeah. the venue kind of said to us like, it's too much. sorry guys, like the, the, the head office has said it's too much heat. Like, um, so we got to try and move, move parties and then we introduced tickets and then that's kind of like a different thing. And yeah, it was just, um, but it was a great, like, you know what I mean? Like, it was a great learning process. Yeah. The same way that being an artist and trying to be a, you know, DIY, self-managed artist, it kind of empowered us and, like, put us in a position where we could start running these parties because we knew how to do artwork <laughs> and we knew how to, you know, put together a promo video and we knew these DJs and these artists and the, you know, the writers who would paint the mural. We knew all these people and it led into that and doing that for the last five years has definitely kind of helped. Yeah. Um, what do you, what do you think has caused, I guess, the growth in the Australian hip hop hip hop over the last two to three years? Like, what do you think has really driven it? Well, I think that again, coming back to the internet and just yeah. the way in which like music and trends and whatnot, like the way it spreads, <clears throat> is 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 just it changes so quickly, and it's yeah. it's it's you know like. When, when I was a teenager, like in my, you know, 15 or whatever and like loving Jay-Z and Rockefeller and yeah. all that sort of stuff, the internet was popping, but it was kind of like, um, you still had to go out and, and, and discover things a little bit. You yeah. know what I mean? Like we used to go to Next Level Records, you know, which was this iconic hip hop store, like a, a music store in the city. And we would go there when we were 12 and like... You know the you know the guys that would run it, the people that would run it would kind of, we were like, so what's new? And they would go, oh, have you heard this artist from where? And they would kind of put the music on like that. Fuck, I sound like an old cunt telling yeah, these nah, stories. Nah, nah. <laughs> but like, I'm thinking, record, like yeah, record yeah, store? like actual an yeah. actual record store. And you know, Damn. we would have to we would listen to the lyrics and kind of you'll put things together, slang and lingo and whatnot. Now you've got genius annotated, yeah, you know and, what and I mean? That it just explains all the things. So yeah. it just happens quicker. You immerse yourself in it quicker. The music spreads. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think that, but also the, 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 just the quality of the music is, is so much like, not just the, the standard of the music, the type of music that's being made is better, but even the way it sounds, you know, the sonics of it, it's just like, mm. it sounds so much better than it did 10 years ago. Yeah. And yeah. interestingly enough, like, Australia was multicultural and like diverse and thriving 
10 years ago. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. It, it was already there. It was already there. You know what I mean? And that's what Australia is like. It is, it is diverse. And that's one of the, it's the best thing about it. Yeah. That's so Australia it just, to me. Exactly. Yeah, to yeah. me as well. You know, like I grew up in the inner West. That's what it's like. Yeah. But it just took a while for music to kind of like, okay. for the, for the hip hop music in the, and you know, most like, uh, rap artists that are kind of big and popping right now, they probably don't consider what they're doing like Australian hip hop. You know what I mean? They just go, we just yeah. make rap. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. We just make music. Like we don't, yeah. you know what I mean? So I think that um, the way in which it's consumed and made and spreads is just has has, has helped shift it. You know? And I know, and that being said in regards to it shifting, I think now it's like, you can go on YouTube right now and an artist can come out now with a decent song, put it on YouTube, and then you get a million views in about two weeks. I've never, I've, I really haven't seen that, that that shift. I really haven't seen so many eyes on Australian or Australian music in ever, ever. And what's cool about it is that now, like you know, I was talking to a couple of my friends. They came from Perth, and they were using some slang that was from Sydney. And I knew some some words are specific to Sydney. Yeah, and I was just like, damn! So it really spread all the way to Perth. You know what I mean? And I was like, wow. This, what, that they heard in like a Hef song they, or something yeah, like that? Yeah, they might have heard, yeah. it's, you know, Eight Slide yeah, and yeah, Hef yeah, song. Yeah. And I'm seeing these people say it, I was like when, when, like, when I was a bit younger, like, some of this shit, like, it was just, it wasn't cool for certain people to be saying it. Like, a lot of people wouldn't have been saying these words. Yeah. It wasn't hip. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or even like, run the ball thing. Well, you know, words like that, you know, it's, a lot of it wasn't hip. And but, then now... But Fast that's thought. totally. I mean, when, when I was when I was growing up, lads, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like they were not like they were not seen as fuck. You know what I mean? Like scummy. Do you know what I mean? TNs. Yeah. They weren't necessarily it was seen as. Yeah. It's a bit of a stigma. Like you yeah. still rocked them and were fresh, but like it was different. And now, I mean, that just shows you the power of music. of music and of hip hop so. and of like taking something which is fucking, you know, disempowered or not not like not popping. Do you know what I mean? And now from just being yourself and from just being what's real to you and dressing how you want to dress and speaking how you want to talk and it resonates with people, yeah. you know, and suddenly it flips on its head. Now every kind of private school kids in the North Shore yeah. getting their mum to take them to JD Sports. I need this tans and that, you know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. it's why, <laughs> you know, like yeah, yeah. it's 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 crazy. Yeah. You know? it's, cra it's, it's cool though, man. I think... I think it's it's not only it's it's just gonna be great for music in general. Man, it doesn't matter what what type of genre of music you put your you 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 make what sort of scene you're in. You can be into rock, punk, whatever, whatever you're in. This is good for music. Period. I mean, you know? I I those videos that you were talking about before, or at least what you were, the reaction you were talking about before that mm -hmm. like school kids are having to acts like one four and hefs and HP boys like yeah. those videos that they sometimes post on the gram yeah. of these like school kids, like they give me fucking goosebumps, bro. Like. I I yeah. see that and it's 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 just so great yeah, it's so beautiful and it's obviously it. like that's something much much bigger and broader than just music it is this creating in these in these young people this sense of pride in who they are and their identity and their cultural heritage and yeah. you know like in ways that you don't normally and that you know it's not really my that's not my thing to to speak on but i see that and i just see this feel this overwhelming sense of pride from these communities that yeah. haven't really felt celebrated so yeah, yeah, do you yeah, know what i mean even yeah. acknowledged in some regards and just to see it celebrated and like it's it's just a beautiful thing it's to hard. watch it's hard, it's hard to be a part of it but i want to get into you know i want to that that being said i know now you've you said earlier that transitioning from an artist to get into event promotion and now being a manager so what were some of the biggest learning curves and sort of pain points that you first experienced in your career and being in sort of getting into management and dealing with artists yeah, I mean, the, the the biggest, certainly like being an artist, like starting from that perspective and kind of like always, um, when you're kind of like a mid-tier artist, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like you're, or even low, low to mid-tier or upper mid-tier, I don't know, however you want to fucking do it. But like you, always, or when you're on the come up, you always have this idea in my head, like I want to get management. You know what I mean? I want, yeah. I want someone to help. Like, I, I, you know, this is what I want to do. But the reality is like good management, it's, it's hard to find. And like, if you're a sort of mid tier artist, the really gun managers are not going to be like knocking on your door because they're already busy with sort of like upper tier uh, yeah. acts. So yeah. kind of feeling frustrated about, oh, why isn't my music going, you know, why isn't it going the way I want it to go and whatnot. Um, that was certainly like one of the early learning curves and kind of managing expectations, but also turning frustration and disappointment 
and rejection, which are all like parts of being an artist, which they don't really tell you about and yeah. self doubt and going through all of that. You have to turn that into a sort of driving, motivating force. And, you know, like with, with uh, my hip hop group with spit syndicate, you know, we went through a, a few managers and I don't want to like disrespect yeah, yeah, them, but yeah. it was always kind of us driving it ourselves and specifically yeah. me, I was heavily involved in that. So yeah. like, I kind of just, well, fuck, if we're not going to get a good manager or we sign to a label, this independent label, that label, oh, you know what? These cunts don't know what they're doing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. why am I putting, you just, it, it, imp you have to just take control of yourself and you have to be self-sufficient. So that yeah. was one of the key lessons I learned. And I said to you before, I'm a big fan in, big fan of um, working with a team. Yeah. You kind of have to do both. You have to be self-sufficient. But you also like you do your best work, in my opinion, when you do have a team. Yeah, do you know what I mean. So yeah. you kind of got to. But by self sufficient, I mean your team has to be self sufficient. Yeah, because yeah. no manager, no label, no agent is ever really going to care about your music or understand it like you do. Yeah, do you know what I yeah. mean. So you've really just kind of got to. You've just got to. Uh, yeah, you you got to got to be good at doing it yourself and yeah. learning. And now that's another thing that you know. YouTube tutorials now, you know Still what I mean? YouTube. There is, there is, there is yeah. a well interviews like this, mm. you know what I mean? This is why I was stoked to be uh, oh, yes, in, 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 invited onto it because yep. you are creating a platform for people and you're, you're speaking to people that are kind of behind the scenes in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. That is a, a resource for, for, for people on the come up. So I guess learning the, the hard way um, in terms of trying to be self-sufficient and you can't really depend on other people like maybe you f originally think you can. Um, I mean, hard lessons as like financial knocks. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I lost yeah. money on tours, lost money on albums. Like in the early days, you know, I went to Westpac and got a 25 grand bank loan, personal loan in order to finance a tour because yeah. no label i was like oh, i'm signed to a record label like are they going to help me tour and no. they're like nah you pay for that yourself and it's expensive so we went and did that and you know we went back to westpac a couple years later when we wanted to do a um this one day only we wanted to do this festival where we brought anderson pack out and whatnot mm -hmm. and we didn't sell enough tickets to that and we lost a whole bunch of money you know what i mean and yeah. like that that's a hard knock even even to this day and then we you know when our one day parties were kind of really popping in perth you know and like that was a city that really kind of embraced the parties that we do yeah we did this huge party and it was so good it was like two and a half thousand people it was the biggest thing we'd ever done at that time and i just and then the company that we were kind of the venue that we were partnered with just went into administration and they said uh oh, we sorry we've gone broke we can't pay you and they had 50 grand, they had 50 racks of our ticket money and I was just kind of like, and that was kind of like, what, the what they can just do that? Yeah. And yeah. that's when I started to learn about, you know, like corporate law and fucking white collar crime. You really yeah. can just do that. You really yeah. can just say, uh, insolvent, you know what I mean? We're in administration now. Sorry, we can't pay you. So like, those have been some of the, like, and again, it's a bit of a cliche thing to say, but you really do, you know, draw the most from your L's. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Not yeah. the fucking, the, the wins and the sold out shows. Like they're great and you know albums and, and all that sort of stuff but if you can bounce back from those l's i mean that's why like going back to what you were saying before about the lockout laws like yeah. obviously yes it is going to be remembered this period as a not like the, the greatest time in terms of sydney's like nightlife and culture culture generally but it's also there has been some amazing things that have happened in this time and i also think it's important to not get caught up in just talking talking down the city yeah, do you know what yeah, i mean yeah, because yeah, it be, like, yeah. yeah be, because you know you 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 create this sort of uh sense of doom and gloom oh everyone sydney is fucked you know what i mean yeah, where it's yeah, like yeah. well do you want to be a part of the like the 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 problem or you want to be part of the solution, solution. do you know right. what i mean yeah. and and i guess in those you know from your l's you fucking bounce back and have your biggest gotta wins. Put in the work i mean a lot of the i now ask you that question because a lot of my friends some of them they're artists and they don't have management or they're artists who've created a song but they literally have no idea of, of anything else and i think one of the biggest things that they're asking me about is you know they 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 always ask about management they always ask okay how do i get my music out how do i approach a manager mm. how do i get someone to help me do what i help me do what i can do because at the end of the day 
I'll give you an example. At the end of the day with this podcast, I would, the, the first couple of episodes, I was doing everything from setting up the mics, setting up the camera, um, doing all this technical shit that I had no idea what I was doing. And then someone told me, someone gave me some good advice and said, hey, like, it's all right to allow other people to come and help you and build upon the skills that you don't have. You know, the center, it's like, look, at the end of the day, I can learn how to, vi- to be a videographer or work on sound. But at the end of the day, I'm not a sound guy. I'm not a videographer. That's not my interest. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Even though when you have something, you should have those interests. Mm-hmm. That's some, sh- some shit I'm just not good at. If you tell me to set up a camera, it's not going to be fire. <laughs> you know, it is what it is. Yeah. So a lot of art, a lot of artists, I feel, they're at that point now. And that's why I ask you, because a lot of my artists are going to watch this and, you know, they're going to f- sort of try to figure out how to plan this shit out rather than just going going and begging another person just to go figure this shit out. Who most ten, nine out of ten times, they don't give a fuck about them. They don't care about what they're doing. They're just sort of looking to exploit them or get, gain something out of it. It might not be financial, but it might be they're just a stepping stone for them to get to a next level, you know. So, And I think your, your message of being self-sufficient is the most important thing. I was just reading upon how, I was reading about how, like, you know, Channel 10, Channel 9, Channel 7, um, they have different types of TV shows. And now what they've been trying to do is they've been trying to attract um, people on Instagram. You know you know how you have those people on Instagram who literally, if you look at the stories of the TV show, they have, like, five-minute, four-minute mm-hmm. stories. Mm-hmm. But if you watch it, it's a TV show. Mm-hmm. So now Channel, 7, now Channel 7, Channel 9, Channel 10 are starting to invest in these people because... Most importantly, they create content. Yes. You know, Channel 9, Channel 10, Channel 7, at the end of the day, they, like, these organizations, these brands, these TV networks, they need you. Yes. You don't necessarily need them anymore. For sure. They need you because you're creating the content. Yeah. Without the, without you, you don't have the content, and they're going to have to keep pumping out corny shit or just keep running home and away, neighbors, continuously, continuously. And I think now, especially with having shit like Netflix, having things like Instagram story where... Someone can, like I said, can literally run a TV show on Instagram. Yeah. They can do that yeah. literally on Instagram. They don't need you. I think that being self-sufficient is going to be the most important thing moving forward. Well, uh, y- yeah. I mean, sorry, were you... No, no, keep going, keep going. Yeah. I mean, I think that what you're saying, like in terms of, you know, when you're on the come up and you're like, oh, I want, I want management or, you know, I want someone to r- represent me or to help build this thing that we, that we want to build. It never works as well when you as the artist have to go and seek out management as opposed to the other way around. Really, in an ideal world, you as an artist want to be making some moves and creating some waves and some buzz, and then management will come and seek you out and tap you on the shoulder and go, hey, I want, I see what you're doing. I want to work with this. Yeah. If you go to Channel 10 and Channel 9 and, do you know what I mean, throw throw rocks at their windows and be like, hey, I'm a, I'm a content creator, like it's not going to work as well. But if you suddenly build an audience online and you sort of create this content to the point that Channel 10 and Channel 9, like you were saying, they can't ignore you yeah. and they kind of, you know, flip it and they say, hey, who's that kid that's making these videos? Like that's obviously an ideal situation, yeah, you know, yeah. but it doesn't necessarily always work like that yeah um yeah i don't know um in terms of manage yeah f- for me i mean i can only really speak about my experience for me i was always kind of like i loved rapping and i love being able to express myself and i love performing live and i love you know the um i just really loved that side of it and i'm super proud of everything that we do and we have done and, and and all that sort of stuff but i was also really drawn to the um i guess you could call the business side of it you know yeah, what i mean yeah. putting putting together a campaign and kind of you know all the different moving parts the the artwork and you know the different artists and creatives that are involved in it, the video side of it how are we going to get this music out to to radio and to now the streaming services and whatnot and then what about hand-to-hand like word of mouth more sort of like guerrilla marketing thing yeah. I, I always liked that part of it yeah so i was drawn to that and so it kind of for me, it has been a bit of a natural transition, kind of doing that on my own music, but now trying to apply it to other people's music and other people's, uh, their campaigns. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean? But as far as, yeah, I, I mean, the internet Google's your friend, bro. You know what I mean? You like that, like you, you like there is, there is, how are you yeah. going to get your, how are you getting your music out there? Why should people pay attention to it? You know what I mean? What's yeah. different about what you're doing? You know what I mean? That no one else is doing and focus on that yeah. because it is so saturated. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But, um, yeah, you, and, and uh, I know you were talking a little bit about your acts and your projects that you're in, in the teams that you're working with. So I want to talk about 
um, the different acts that you're working with. So let's talk about you. Were, I, th- I think what's very unique about the acts you're working with is that they're all extremely different. For example, um, let's, for example, chilling it an eighteen year old man. Mm-hmm. They are completely different. Yes. But you know what? But in, the same in regards to how creative and all, and, and different they are, if that makes sense. If yeah. You, if that may, I don't know. Oh, bro, I'm, you know? I'm, the, the difference between them, but also the, the, the similarities. It's it, large. It's <laughs> well, large. Just they're both thriving and they're both popping, but just in very different ways. Right, exactly. So so how did you get into sort of managing chilling it I'll, I'll get into both of them but how did you get into managing chilling it and what sort of attracted you to what he was what he was doing because i know you're working as part of a like a bigger management team so what sort of attracted you to to get into that i mean i'd heard his name kicked around a little bit because yeah. like part of what i mean i'm always trying to stay in touch with 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 who's coming up and what's popping but definitely doing the one day parties the one yeah. day sundays in different cities and whatnot it has one of the things I'm most grateful for is that it has kind of connected me with a lot of in these different cities, the DJs, the artists, the creatives that are kind of popping. And it has really sharpened my senses of like keeping an eye out for who's doing what. And, um, chill didn't necessarily come across my radar through the one day parties, but it was, uh, at it. One of the guys in one day, one of my partners who kind of came to me and was like, have you heard of this, of this kid chilling it? Like, you know, he had just done that, triple j you know grime sci-fi that had just kind of like was setting the internet on fire and whatnot and i'd seen him commenting on spit syndicate posts from before and i'd I'd kind of seen that but i wasn't heaps familiar with it and then at it kind of got in my ear it was like wow you should check out this kid like he's really talented yeah he's really dope um and i sort of started to like dive into it and i was like blown away by it you know what i mean like i was really into obviously the first thing that drew me to it first and foremost was um he's he's rapping you know what i mean like yeah. he's a great Spit rapper he's Spit a great rapper shit, yeah. and i'm a, i'm a i'm a rap fan you know what i mean i'm a, I'm a yeah, student yeah. of the game yeah, you know yeah, what i mean and yeah. i i love seeing cunts just rapping you know yeah, what i mean he yeah. definitely does that i was also really drawn to his kind of like diy self-made sort of the ascension that he was kind of on do you know what i mean for yeah. for a long time the traditional way that i mean triple j have just kind of been the gatekeepers in terms of independent australian music yep. even yep. for hip-hop you know what yeah. i mean until yeah. recently yep. um and chill was kind of like you really using instagram and youtube and yeah. facebook all these social media tools to build this audience and to build this kind of platform in a way i hadn't seen before yeah. and he was bypassing these kind of traditional um, avenues avenues yeah. and yeah. i was really drawn to that and i really liked that and he was kind of quite <laughs> anti-industry do you know what yeah, i mean yeah, and yeah. like so I, you know, I spoke with uh, another one of my friends who I hadn't really partnered with before, Weez, who's uh, based in Melbourne, and he's kind of done a lot of things in the industry, but he traditionally has managed producers. So he managed Uno okay. Stereo, Styles Fuego, a whole whole bunch of stuff in that world. And I kind of showed, you know, we started talking about Chill, and he was like, you know what, we should we should do some business together, and we should work with this kid. Yeah. And I was like. He, do you think he wants management like yeah, look at him yeah. his whole thing is like sort of like i'm just it's just fucking turbulent and it's red hot and it's yeah. like you know what i mean and it's you know fuck the industry like fuck are these cunts i don't need yeah. that i'm just rapping yeah you know what i mean but at the same time i was also kind of um because it was growing so fast i we also recognize that it needs some structure yeah put into it to really grow this act and to really grow this business it does need some things plugged into it so i connected with chill like through um through at it and who you know we got some studios in newtown and triple yeah. one were in there a lot of the time and their boys with chill and so they came through and i met him and he was a fan of spit syndicate from back in the day so he kind of like um and you know he's also a businessman you know like he understands uh the business side of things i think uh a lot better than people probably give him credit for on 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 the surface surface level maybe yeah, when it's yeah. easy to look at his instagram and go this is someone you know is a lad who's into fucking strippers and smoking weed you know what i mean yeah, a whole but bunch like, of too. But man, shout out shout out to him shout, i gotta give him a shout out shout out chilling it man be who you are dog because that shit real 
Yeah, man, well, that that's fucking real. That, that, he is who he is, man. Yeah. He is who he is. I mean, you want to talk about, like, he, he was basically a 24 hour reality TV show via his Instagram stories. Yeah. Yep, Do you yep. know what I mean? And he spends a lot of time doing these motivational talks yeah. to his audience, and people really love that shit about him. Yeah. And, you know, even to this day, part of the re- a huge, maybe the biggest part of his success has been he puts his fans first above yeah. anything else and he also really understands his audience yeah he knows and what they want yeah, you know and, and just getting into that i know we talked about a little bit about, about this and i really want to get into it um a little bit about we, we talked about it in outside about um the the correlation between streams and views versus actual fans and actually having a market where you can actually monetize your i want to well i guess monetize your market and monetize the people who are actually into and engaged in what you're doing. I think that's something, you know, because just talking about what we were talking about in regards to a lot of acts, they can get a whole bunch of streams, they can get a whole bunch of YouTube views, but when it comes down to actually monetizing your act and doing shows, selling merch, they can't do that because their their market their their, their market or their, their engagement isn't just there. One thing that Chillin has done, that's I, I think that's been great business and a great, it shows what type of mind that he is, is that he's been able to connect the two doing well on YouTube, doing well on the streaming platforms, but also doing well going touring. Because, you know, at the end of the day, if you can tour and you can sell something out, that's when you know you got people who actually like, Not, I wouldn't say that's the only way of measurement, but that's when you know that whatever you're doing is very reactive and whatever you're doing is starting to work. Yeah, and um, it's real. Yeah, it's real. Exactly. How, do you, how do you take this online buzz and these kind of numbers and this viral engagement, how do you turn that into a lasting sustainable career yeah do you know what i mean that's yeah. that's kind of key but you just got to invest in your audience and you know what i mean like he has always invested he's put his own money up at the start he really kind of like is a has has believed very strongly in investing in um and giving his fans what they want that's <laughs> yeah, and that's put, honey, and, yeah. and that's putting out albums that's putting out albums and like and starting small with the touring yeah. is kind of how you develop a fan base i mean that's something that you know we definitely took from i guess back in my artist days yeah you know what i mean we would go and do these tours and often the venues were a quarter half full but like you kept coming back Vince and fuller. you kept and like yeah. and we would hang and ch- talk with people at the merch stand after the show and thank them and you know what i mean and then the next time we would come back there would be a few more people there yeah and then suddenly the tour started actually breaking even and then making money and funnily enough after the 10 years plus of doing it you know you would start to see fans who you grow up with your fans and they become sort of like friends in in different cities and like that's an example of kind of like growing a fan base and sort of investing in it do you know what i mean chill as an as an example you know he's very focused on his underage fans yeah under 18s fans they don't really get many opportunities to see live music you know but he's yeah. always kind of been like not nah, there um they're really important to me and they always get overlooked. I don't want them to get overlooked. So last year when we did his first like national big tour, yeah. you know, the Ashes tour off the back of Women, Weed and Wordplay. And he, he, he was like, Women, oh. women Weed and Wordplay. Let's just take that back. I mean, have That's you? Like, yeah, uh, yeah, but I'm just saying that is a fucking title. Women, women Weed and, and Wordplay. Wordplay. I mean, he describes it as his life. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. And he had, a, he had a different album cover yeah. for it. And then at the last minute, he goes, you know what? I'm just going to use this. Yeah. He did a Kanye right at the last minute. Yeah, takes like, a photo out of the train. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, just with some, some, some girls he was with on a night in the Gold Coast. And that was the kind of, that's also him. That's just like, nah, this is what we're doing this an idea and i'm i'm standing standing by it yeah. but he wanted to do two innings for this yeah. tour right he wanted to do the over 18 shows and then he wanted to do a separate run of under 18 shows and we as management were kind of like well look why don't we like just in terms of like a financial perspective it would make sense to do these shows together when you're in melbourne do an over 18 and then no, do under an under 18, 18. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and he was like no nah, no nah, i don't want to do that i want them to be separate i want to do the sec the under 18 shows in the school holidays um, ah, and yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? I want them to have their own thing. Yeah. And we were like, all right, whatever you want to do. But obviously financially, it no cuts way. into your margin yeah. if you're going to Melbourne twice. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But he was like, no, nah, this is what we're doing. And all the shows sold out and his under 18s market is, you know, thriving. And that's just an example of him sort of like, you know, 
how do you you invest and you and you give your fans and you reply to comments and I mean he doesn't so Small much things, he doesn't yeah. do that as much anymore now because his audience is just fucking so big yeah. but as he was growing that's he was you know replying to messages on his inbox he was doing all of that sort of stuff and that's how you kind of you know and he talks to his fans like they're a family you know yeah. what I mean this is a community this is a family we look out for each other like it's very smart it's great and then on the other end you have 18 year old man who I think his his production is fucking crazy. You know, yeah. I, I, I was I was talking to him on the DMs. I was reaching out to him, and I was like, and I was like, this guy, his production level is fucking crazy. I think I met him. We had this like aria party thing, like a nomination, mm -hmm. and we were there. And you know, very humble guy. He like you know, he was like, hey, what's up? My name is um. And I asked him. You know, it's funny. I asked him. I'm not sure if he remembers this. So I asked. Him, I was like, yo, man, what's your name? And then he says, he said something. I couldn't hear him. He's very, he's very, he's very you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. very quiet. And then I was like, I, I heard something. I was like, oh yeah. So what's your name? And he goes, eighteen year old man. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> and he goes, eighteen year old man. <laughs> and then, yeah. But anyways, you know, he's he's he just won an aria. Yeah, for he his, for his production. Yeah, he he co-produced he co-produced uh, Miss Shiny the K yeah. uh, single, which won the aria, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful thing. He, I mean, he came into my world through, um, like in a kind of different way to, to, to chill, which chill was kind of like already sort of like on, on the come up and you could see that there was something happening. Yeah. I met 18 year old man or Vinny. Vinny, yeah. Um, just through like, you know, he's, he's from the inner West and like, even yeah. though we kind of like, he's, he's a couple years young, he's quite a few years younger than me, but like, he's not 18. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Which well, people don't know he's not 18. <laughs> he's, he's not 18. 18. A yeah. lot of people are like, fuck, is he kind of really 18? Yeah. I'm like, nah, nah. <laughs> You can talk to him about that, but he he was recommended. He was put forward as a as a recommended keys player in in my band at the time by yeah. by Freddie Krabs from Sticky Fingers. He was kind of like because we were trying to add some live instrumentation into our yeah. on our live show, you know, and 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 Krabs was like, you got to talk to Vinny, you know. What I mean, Vinny is a fucking dude on yeah. the keys, and so we met him. He came to like a studio rehearsal session and. We were just fucking blown away by how good he was at the keys, but also he's just like the loveliest dude. Nice guy. And nice we just guy. kind of clicked. Me, Jimmy, Jono, and Vinny, we were just on tour. We were, and then we started doing, when we were doing these writing trips, um, you know, we used to go down to a holiday house. Um, hire it or get it borrowed off a fan if yeah. we could, and and <laughs> and we would you know upend all the all the furniture yeah. and take equipment down and just spend a week writing music. You know what I mean? Damn. And then we started taking Vinny on these trips, and you know the the other guys in the crew, the the producer would just kind of look around and be like, "Fuck, man!" The ideas, like the different sort of ideas, just kind of came to him like he just had yeah. this insane amount of talent and these producers were kind of producing him directing yeah. him hey play this try this try it with this sound blah yeah. blah blah he's kind of morphed now into he's the producer he yeah. has just kind of and it's not just keys you know what i mean he plays guitar he's you know he plays a whole bunch of things now he's kind of yeah he's 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 doing he's got some really exciting stuff in the pipeline he's a yeah. very talented musician He's doing a lot of co-production work. So, you know, him and um, him and Nick Martin, Uno yeah, Stereo, yeah, you know, yeah. they got in together and they, with Kate, they made that Miss Shiny. Yeah. And, you know, he was, he co-produced the um, Triple One, Matt Corby, Kwame song, yeah, So yeah. Easy. He's working with a lot of producers in the States. We're about to go over to LA. I was in LA with him last year um, in September. We were meant to be there for like, three weeks yeah i was gonna stay for 10 days or whatever he's gonna be there for three weeks he ended up being there for two months we just Damn. kept extending his trip because yeah. it was just like working grinding. Yeah, yeah you know and he's re he's really highly in demand because he just as a musician he, and as a uh, i guess a as a producer but as an instrumentalist he can kind he's of just no. lay source in a way you know yeah. what i mean i had this moment and we were like we were in yeah, the rapper Boogie, Westside yeah, Boogie, you know yeah. what I mean? We're in his apartment somewhere in LA, again, through a friend of a friend, whatever. We ended up in his apartment <clears throat> with like his his producer and Vinny who has all these samples, these loops, this yeah. library of like ideas yeah. that he's kind of started, textures, chord progressions. We're in this like pretty fucking basic apartment with Boogie who's just, you know, sitting on the, sitting on like the couch, just playing fucking NBA or whatever. Mm -hmm. And like Vinny's just scrolling through these ideas and like Boogie would occasionally look up and go, yeah, that's fire. Yeah. That one's fire. And then go back to the thing. Oh yeah, that that's one's the one. fire. <laughs> and I was just kind of like, and, and I was like, fuck, this is. 
this is a guy who, you know, Vinny, I, I like telling this story. We played this Spit Syndicate tour. No, it wasn't a tour. It was Falls Festival yeah. over New Year's. But it was like the early, um, the first day. You know what I mean? It was like the early, the first day of the festival. We were on pretty early. Like yeah. it wasn't a fucking popping time time slot or whatever. But we did this one on, on New Year's Eve in, in Byron. And it was like 40 fucking degrees. We played at 12 p.m. It was a small crowd because yeah. it was the searing 40, heat. Yeah, and then years. afterwards, Vinny was just kind of like, man, you know what? Like thank you boys so much like two years ago i never i thought i was about to give up on music and now i'm here with my friends and we're like he was just he was so fucking blown away by that that was yeah. two years ago yeah. now we're in boogie's apartment in la and he's just on the keys like you know what i mean and i and then that is man some of the other stuff that's in the pipeline that i can't even talk about just yeah, now yeah. seeing his his how he has been embraced it's just, yeah. And a huge part of it is he's just got such a lovely energy, a positive energy super to be nice around. Yeah. He's a super nice guy. And you love, you know, you love to see people like that winning. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, Oof. yeah, chill is very much public facing and fucking turbulent. Yeah. And yeah, like, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. and, and Vinny, 18 year old man is much more sort of like, it's behind it's the chill. scenes. It's chill. it's chill, but it's just as exciting, just as you know? But man, look, I would like to thank you. Um, you know, this has been a very good episode. I think, I think the especially with the two acts, chilling and an eighteen year old. I think they're gonna have a very big year. I chilling and it's already touring, and I've seen the tour, fucking selling out everywhere, which mm. has been super. It's just been cool to see an artist selling out tours. You know, I think that's always cool to see, especially with hip hop. It really shows the demand. I think, um, yeah. And look, I just wanna uh, thank you for coming on. We're gonna end the podcast. So yeah. Thank you for yeah, having me, man. I no hope I, I hope there's something in what I just fucking rambled yeah, that you can someone can take something yeah, from. Yeah. I appreciate you and what you're doing. So thank no you, worries. man. Thanks, man.